Welcome to the Cambridge Neuroscience Interdisciplinary Seminar Series. This series features current work from across the schools and departments of the University of Cambridge, reflecting the pioneering work and diverse interests of members of Cambridge Neuroscience. Today, for the second in our series, we welcome Professor David Menon, Head of Division of Anesthesia of Department of Medicine at Addenbrooke's Hospital at the University of Cambridge. David is going to present a talk on his recent work detailing neuro-COVID, epidemiology, biomarkers and pathophysiology. Enjoy. Uh, this was the title I was going to talk about, and I'm very fortunate that Paul spoke first because uh, it saves me the trouble of having to talk about the psychiatric and psychological health aspects. But the second thing it allows me to do is to actually acknowledge the huge number of people on behalf of whom I'm presenting this data from the critical care unit, from neurology and rehabilitation, from psychiatry, from neuropathology, radiology and research imaging, other people from ENT and infectious disease, the big group at the Wolfson Brain Imaging Center who made all of our imaging possible, uh, folk at the clinical research facility, particularly Anne Elmer, who's been really key in, in uh, recruiting patients alongside Joe Outram, uh, Dot uh, Chatfield, and, and Anne Manklow. And then the Biomedical Research Center, John Bradley and Natalie Kingston, who drive the um, uh, COVID virus source on which we consent our patients, the NIHR Clinical Network, the Addenbrooke Hospital R&D, particularly uh, Helen Street and Adam Loveday, who helped with the paperwork for this, and our external collaborators. So these are the themes I'm going to address. First of all, the context, which is both local and global. So when this all started, uh, now nearly five months ago, we published this sort of position piece in neurocritical care, which looked at the initial reports coming out saying that neuro neurological complications occurred in about 20 to 30% of patients admitted to hospital and made the point that this was a hugely um, variable mechanistic process. It could be simply because patients were very sick. They had hypotension, hypoxia, micro and macrovascular thrombosis because of uh, increased coagulability of the blood. Uh, there could be immunological uh, responses that uh, resulted in injury to the brain. There could be innate uh, activation of the micro, uh, immune activation of the microglia and a maladaptive cytokine profile, which was coupled with a very diffuse phenotypic spectrum of septic encephalopathy and delirium. But this was also an opportunity because uh, Sankhya or Potentia est, uh, knowledge is power. So what we had the opportunity to do in, in Addenbrooke's is to make use of the facilities we have this is the neuro ICU 17 bedded, and it's right next to the Wolfson Brain Imaging Center, which has our workhorse Prisma 3P MR scanner, a 70 MR scanner, which we use for more specific indications, and a PET MR system here, which is currently, uh, or in the acute phase of the uh, pandemic, was not being used actively. So this provides us with the opportunity of looking at, perhaps more than most other places, the acute physiology using advanced imaging techniques, particularly MR. We also had uh, links with people outside Cambridge in, in a variety of consortia because no one can do this alone. And the consortia that I've been part of include the Global Consortium Study of Neurological Dysfunction and COVID-19, which is part of the Neurocritical Care Society. And we've been trying to put together case report forms that can be used for universal uh, study use across the world. And very importantly, the coroner uh, studies, which is led by uh, uh, Ben Michael from Liverpool, which has been tracking cases using a variety of professional bodies since the start of the pandemic. There is also the European Asso Academy of Neurology, which has a similar um, uh, initiative, which I'm not part of. But all of these put together are actually bringing uh, knowledge to bear on the issue of neurocovid. So that's the context, both local and global, from where I'm going to draw uh, some of our results and put it in the context of stuff that's been published. So let's start off by looking at the epidemiology and clinical presentation. So the coronary studies, uh, we published on the first 153 patients in Lancet Psychiatry some time ago online. It's very difficult now to keep track of when papers came out online because they tend to be three, four, five months 
before the actual publication date. And the coroner studies are now up to 800 cases, led, as I said, by Ben Michael, Reese Thomas, and Yingalia. And this is the first 153 uh, rapid reports, excluded some because of unavailable cases. Of the 125 cases that were included, we had a large number with cerebral vascular events, uh, about a third with altered mental status, about uh, one in 20 with peripheral disorders, Guillain-Barre syndrome, peripheral neuropathy, and 2% with other neurological disorders. So this is the spectrum of abnormalities, but it's useful to think about the age distribution because what you see are the cerebrovascular disorders, at least in this first 150 patients, occurring in the older patient group. And I'll come back to this in a little more detail because that's really common. But the neuropsychiatric uh, encephalopathic pictures, the delirium, were seen in, in much younger patients going down to as, as low as 21 to 30. It's worth saying, however, that these stroke-like uh, syndromes, including large vessel occlusions, are seen in younger patients, often without risk factors, suggesting that the disease was not just precipitating stroke in older patients, but was causing stroke probably in younger patients. So, so much uh, for what's happened in the UK population. As part of the um, uh, GCS NeuroCOVID, I um, was also collaborating with Jenny Frontera and her colleagues in in New York, and they looked, and this talks to the density of cases in New York, they looked across this period at 12,000 cases who had gone through their systems and found that um, uh, nearly 1,000 of them had new uh, neurological findings. When you button down the cases that were PCR positive for SARS-CoV-2, there were 606 out of a total of um, about 4,000 patients, we add those two together, it's about 4,400 patients, which gives you, if you look at the table on the right, nearly 20% of patients, of hospitalized patients, having a neurological event, including a toxic metabolic encephalopathy, stroke, hypoxic and oxic brain injury, just headache, seizure, movement disorders, peripheral neuropathies, myopathies, Guillain-Barre syndrome, and then uh, loss of taste or smell. But in the 26 patients who had lumbar punctures and CSF samples, at that stage, they found no one who they grew um, or they could do a PCR and find positivity for the virus in the CSF. Since then, there's been um, some more uh, detailed uh, phenotypic characterization of these patients. And this is one of the papers that emerged from Queen Square. Uh, these are the two joint first authors and Heidi Mungi and and uh, Mike Zandi are the two senior authors. This was 43 patients where they found that the severity of neurological disease was unrelated to the severity of respiratory COVID. 29 of these were definite PCR positive patients. Eight had supportive lab features. And I'll come back to this at the end of the uh, talk with increased inflammatory markers and so on, and six of whom had epidemiological associations of no possible. So they've totaled these definite, probable, and possible patients and classified them into different syndromic groups, encephalopathies, CNS inflammation, ischemic stroke, peripheral nervous system involvement, and a miscellaneous uh, ragtag of uh, syndromes. These encephalopathies had delirium, the CSF and the MR tended to be nonspecific. Uh, supportive care was all you had to offer, but most patients made a relatively good outcome. The CNS inflammation group had encephalitis, uh, acute disseminated encephalomyelitis, necrotizing encephalitis and myelitis, supportive care, steroids, sometimes other immunomodulatory interventions, and they had varied outcomes, not uniformly good. Ischemic stroke, very often large vessel stroke, sometimes in younger patients. This was in patients who seemed very often to have a prothrombotic picture. Some of them had associated pulmonary emboli, the treatment was varied depending on the stroke and, and exactly what was happening to the patient, and the outcome was varied. And then you have patients with Guillain-Barre syndrome or brachial plexopathy. Many of the patients who had the brachial plexopathy had very severe respiratory COVID, had had to be prone, may have had traction injury to their brachial plexuses. And they were treated with physiotherapy as they recovered. Prevention is important in terms of the brachial plexopathy because positioning might make a difference and outcomes uh, may be an issue. And then there were these miscellaneous uh, 
patients who had a variety of, uh, of um, conditions which spanned many of these across, across these. When you go looking at the stroke pictures, what you find is that the characteristics and outcomes of patients with stroke who have COVID-19 and acute ischemic stroke from other historical comparisons are slightly different. This is from the Swiss registry. And what you find, if you look at the distributions here of the blue and the red for the severity of the stroke, you find that the patients with COVID-19 related stroke have subtly but significantly more severe strokes and worse outcomes. And then more recently, this paper has tried to find out what the actual incidence of stroke is, and it boils down to between 15% and 18% of strokes, 18% for all strokes, and 15% for patients who have ischemic strokes. And if you look at the outcomes, they, they can be clustered uh, into two groups. Cluster one, which is different in its outcome from cluster two, with lower mortality. But the one thing that um, distinctly identifies cluster two from cluster one is having very severe or critical COVID-19. So while having severe respiratory COVID-19 is not necessarily a marker of uh, having stroke, it may be a marker of worse outcomes from stroke, perhaps because of the general state of the patient. So these have been accompanied by a whole host of uh, neuroimaging case reports and uh, short case series. And I've simply put up the most recent of these. There's a variety of uh, findings. You have patients who have intracranial hemorrhage or infarction, leukoencephalopathy or multiple uh, infarctions. And some of these are described here on CT or MR, uh, posterior fossa hemorrhage here, small subarachnoid hemorrhages, here, small intracerebral microhemorrhages, an infarction on diffusion-weighted MR image, leukoencephalopathy on diffusion-weighted and flared images. So I'm not going to show you repeated case reports, just to make the point that the imaging findings are, are pleomorphic. They fit the variety of clinical syndromes that we've seen before uh, in the clinical epidemiology, and are as you would expect. It's useful, however, to to compare those with the neuropathological specimens. And this was the first uh, paper that had a reasonable number of specimens. 18 patients in the New England Journal of Medicine who had died between zero and 32 days after the onset of symptoms. And here they showed only hypoxic changes. There was no encephalitis or what they labeled specific changes. No virus on immunohistochemistry, PCR at low levels in five patients, which may have been due to viral uh, RNA in blood in, in the frozen sections that were taken from these patients. However, there's been a, a more complete analysis in this paper from Germany, which looked at post-mortem appearances in 43 patients uh, between half a century old and nearly a century old. And you have uh, a variety of locations. These are exemplar locations in frontal cortex, basal ganglia, upper medulla, lower medulla, the cerebellum and the olfactory bulb. And when we come and talk about pathophysiology and mechanisms, it will become obvious why we are, are focusing on these areas. And what they found was that there was fresh territorial ischemic lesions in, in about 15% uh, of patients, but very, very widespread astroglial proliferation. You can see GFAP, which is an astroglial marker across all of these, particularly in the olfactory bulb, really strong bounce, brown staining. Microglial activation here identified with the HLA-DR staining, but also cytotoxic T lymphocytes, both in the brainstem and cerebellum and also in the meninges. They found SARS-CoV-2 in uh, nearly half of these patients, most commonly in lower cranial nerves or in isolated cells of the brainstem. And you can see here immunohistochemistry for the nucleocapsid protein or the spike protein, just isolated cells showing it. Or interestingly, in the cranial nerves, again, we'll talk about this when we come back to potential pathophysiology. But what they found was that the presence of SARS-CoV-2 in the CNS was unassociated with the severity of neuropathological changes. So how does this tie up with what we've been finding? And I'm going to sort of bring together two of the papers uh, that we've published, first looking at 
the MR imaging, which is the neuroanatomical substrates of generalized brain dysfunction, uh, work done by the, the uh, NeuroCOVID imaging group here, led uh, by Virginia Newcomb uh, in the analysis, and then neuropathological analysis, which was run by Kieran Allenson with many collaborators, both within and outside Cambridge. And as far as the imaging was, uh, analysis uh, was concerned, we asked a slightly different question from what um, other people have been asking. Clearly, MR and CT imaging, for that matter, show abnormalities which replicate what you might see uh, based on the clinical features. But we wanted to ask, if you looked at brains or brain regions which were not obviously lesioned, did they have microstructural abnormalities that uh, reflected what we might find later on in terms of sequelae? And then when we looked at these two neuropathological findings, we asked the question in two sample patients who had similar clinical syndromes. They were not waking up at the end of a critical illness uh, episode. And we asked, can we find different neuropathological substrates of this clinical syndrome? And when we did the imaging findings, we found that these were patients where the conventional MRI was uh, completely normal, but quantitative MR was widely abnormal. But this quantitative MRI varied with brain regions. And very broadly, if we divided up the super, into suprasensorial compartment and the brain stem and cerebellum separately, we found very different findings on diffusion-weighted imaging and calculation of diffusivity of water. For those of you who are not familiar, a high diffusivity of water suggests that there's leaky blood vessels a low diffusivity of water has been associated with swelling of cells and perhaps inflammatory exudates in the brain. And what we found was in the suprasentorial compartment, it looked as though the blood vessels had all become quite leaky. And remember, most of these brain regions were normal on conventional MRI when, by just looking at it. But there was a clear separation of controls, which are age match controls, and the patients which were with all of these patients showing in multiple regions of the brain, essentially in all of the lobes, very leaky compartment. This difference was present here in the brainstem as well, but was reversed and reached significance in these two parts of the brain, the mesencephalic reticular formation and the oral pond, where now the brainstem showed that there was cytotoxic swelling or there was imaging findings suggestive of inflammatory cell infiltrate. If you now then go to Kieran's paper, which looked at histology, we found different kinds of histology. Up in the supratentorial compartment, we found microthrombosis and microhemorrhages, necrosis around this, in some cases, furious um, uh, leak of the blood vessels, sometimes with megakaryocytes and accelerated calcification. Whereas when we went out to the brainstem, we found mononuclear cell infiltrates, suggesting that there was local inflammation. Recapitulating the more recent review or the more recent case series that I showed you, suggesting that what's happening in the brainstem is inflammatory, and what's happening up in the supraventorial compartment may be a much more microthrombotic, leaky vessel kind of picture. So we have this dichotomization, not just of the imaging findings, but also of what's happening pathologically in the brain, which may provide particular insights in, in the cases. So that was one thing that we could do because we could do, just going back, these in the acute phase, these were sick patients and let alone their hearts, we know that the coronaries and the cardiac function may be uh, affected by, by COVID. These patients were taken to a scan because we needed to find out what was happening clinically to them to make important uh, treatment decisions about them. And they were not easy patients to take to the scanner and it's a tribute both to the clinical teams taking the patients to the scanner, but very importantly, to the imaging teams at the Wolfson Brain Imaging Center that we could take these very sick patients on 100% oxygen at the very limit of what we could do safely and get these findings which were important, not just for research, but also for individual patients. But the other thing we could do was also to look serially from the acute time point. And I'm going to just give you one case to illustrate this. This is a 71-year-old patient who presented with severe respiratory failure. And just as we were coming off um, the initial acute phase, 
develop a non-responsive clinical picture with generalized jerking, which is not epilepsy uh, on an EEG with bouncing eye movements. So Steve, Steve Saucer, one of our neurology colleagues, diagnosed an obstaclonus myoclonus syndrome, which has been described previously in paraneoplastic uh, conditions and also with other viral infertility. And we managed to scan this guy on day 14, 33, and 46 after his acute illness. Now, these first two scans were when patient, the patient was very sick, and it not, would not have been easy to, to do in other places, but the juxtaposition of the Wilson Brain Imaging Center with the ICU allowed us to do this safely. So the first part of the story is pretty simple. What we found on day 46 was these white matter abnormalities on flare images. Not at all exciting, not at all exciting. These are often age-related and of no consequence at all reported by many people, both in the context of COVID and other diseases. But what we did have was earlier imaging done on day 14 and day 33. What you can find is that in the identical slices, there were no abnormalities at all. And these age-related leukomalacia changes were evolving as the patient was having these findings and were progressive with the pathology of the disease. Was it directly related to obstaclonus myoclonus? We don't know. It may just have been because this patient was experiencing a cytokine storm and the burden of physiological insults that being very sick on an ICU was associated with. But what it showed us incontrovertibly was that this was not a, an age-related finding that was there from the start, but this was something that his critical illness and his COVID had given him. So that's the epidemiology and clinical presentation. What could be the underlying mechanisms and pathophysiology? So this nice review article from JAMA Neurology a couple of months ago makes the point that the ACE2 receptor, which the coronavirus binds to, is present on both neurons in many parts of the brain, in the motor cortex, in the temporal cortex, basal ganglia, uh, in the brainstem, and also in a variety of, of uh, cell types of the brain. Indeed, other review articles suggest that these cell types, perhaps the astrocytes in the brain, the oligodendrocytes, and the sustentacular cells in, in the nasal mucosa may be the prime sites of infection of these viruses, but they also get into, into the neurons. And there's also evidence that not just for SARS-CoV-2, but other coronaviruses, beta coronaviruses in particular, there can be synaptic transmission and then transmission along fat microtubules, fast axonal transport microtubules, retrograde across the synaptic barrier. So the patient has uh, a, a sensory neuron in the nose or other parts uh, of the body, perhaps in the lung, that picks up these viruses, transported across on axonal pathways, and then transmitted across here. And within a couple of axon, uh, a couple of synaptic junctions, can get to quite deep parts of the brain. And indeed, serial imaging can show this sometimes. You also have blood brown uh, exit of the viruses, either as the virus itself, when the patient is viremic, or through this Trojan horse mechanism, where infected leukocytes get through a leaky blood-brain barrier, which we've shown both in pathology and uh, on the imaging uh, in the brain. I found that this paper was very useful in taking all of that pathophysiology and trying to tie it into um, the various syndromes we talked about at the start. We have a whole um, chunk of systemic disease, multiple organ failure, coagulopathy, and inflammation, which results in hypoxic and metabolic encephalopathy, stroke, or an inflammatory encephalopathy that uh, has been seen in other conditions. So this we can understand. It's probably common to a lot of critical illness. And I'll come back again to this at the end. There may be a direct inv invasion of the CNS by uh, the virus, causing viral enkephalitis, meningitis, or endothelial infection, the so-called endotheliolitis. This may be quite common. The meningitis and enkephalitis, there's increasing numbers of case reports coming, but this is certainly not common. There may be peripheral nerve or muscle involvement causing anosmia, agusia, neuropathy, and muscle injury. I don't know how much of this is directly related specifically to the virus because we can get critical illness, neuropathy, and myopathy in other conditions as well. And then this whole chunk of post-infectious immune-mediated, host-response mediated, Guillain-Barre syndrome, acute disseminated enkephalomyelitis, and similar immune-mediated conditions. 
which are not because of the virus or the infection or the systemic host response, but because of an adaptive uh, immune response to the virus. What about when they happen? So this is um, at the time when this paper was published, the best understanding of where this is. My sense from looking at the literature beyond this is perhaps it's much more variable. This is probably true. You have uh, an episode of viral DNA, uh, sorry, RNA is detectable in uh, secretions or in the blood. You have an acute IgM response and IgG response, and somewhere along this, a T cell response is also important. You have a clinical presentation, perhaps an acute encephalitis and myelitis, uh, immune-mediated mechanisms and cerebrovascular disease. Some of these are because of the virus itself. Some of these are immune responses, and some of these are because of non-immune host responses, such as hypercoagulability. And you can postulate a variety of neuropathogenic mechanisms. And here's the timeline for, the, for this. My sense is that I would find it difficult to understand how a virus from the onset of the symptom uh, could cause Guillain-Barré-like picture many days earlier, unless there was a subclinical infection that, the, that was present and causing an immune response. But we know that many of these can carry on for long periods after that. But this, I think, is a useful schematic for us to understand that there are varied drivers, varied clinical presentations, and varied links between these. We do know uh, that the virus does get into the brain uh, from other conditions as well. You saw the nucleic acid and spike protein in the postmortem uh, picture in the, in the Lancet Neurology paper I showed you much earlier in the talk. And it's been seen in other conditions such as original SARS where in-situ hybridization is pretty uniformly able to detect the genomic sequence in the cytoplasm of cells in the brain. But uh, just sorry, going back, the issue is that some of the controls that have been done for SARS, SARS original SARS with negative control using other um, primers and using the genomic sequences that you're looking for with SARS in brains uh, that do not have COVID have not been done with the same uh, frequency. So we, we, we're looking for more evidence in this area. The second thing is what happens in terms of the autoimmune response. And this is a paper that's still uh, in preprint stage, but I think probably sums up uh, a large number of cases. This looked at 11 consecutive severely ill COVID patients with unexplained neurology with a prominent myoclonic cranial nerve involvement or encephalopathic picture. Many of these showed CSF-PSITOSIS and increased neurofilament light. So neurofilament light is an axonal protein that's shed by degenerating axons, and it was elevated in some of these patients. A couple of these patients had antibodies against well-established targets that uh, are known to cause autoimmune encephalopathy, anti-NMDA receptor antibodies, anti-YO antibodies, but most were negative on, on a wide range of autoantibodies. But when they looked at this um, in terms of the binding and fluorescent um, detection, on mouse brain slices, they found autoantibodies against a variety of uh, structures in the brain, including the endothelium, astrocytes, and the neuropil itself. And this is their phrase. Um, this is a strong association. But they posit that this may be uh, evidence of a causal relation to clinical symptoms, particularly to these hyperexcitability uh, clinical syndromes, myoclonus, which may be modifiable by immunomodulation. To go back to our obstaclonus myoclonus man, um, this is a useful uh, point to make. We treated him with intravenous immunoglobulin, and he made a substantial recovery and returned to clinic, having uh, recovered substantially very recently. So we've talked about the mechanisms and pathophysiology. What about what happens to these patients? Because the fact that our patient came back is very interesting point, but what happens to them more broadly? So these are patients who've had a lot of insults. They've had bad lung, perhaps heart uh, physiological changes with hypoxia and hypotension. They've had a cytokine storm. They may have developed autoimmune responses against brain antigens. We know they can have uh, differential effects on the supratentorial and infratentorial compartments. 
they've had prolonged critical care. They've been flooded with a variety of sensitive agents which we know can cause delirium and perhaps uh, contribute to late cognitive decline. And they've had a variety of psychological stressors, both because of the illness and most uh, widely because of the societal influences both before and after their illness in terms of being locked down, isolated and so on. And all of these we know are increasingly being recognized as causes or at least association in a subset of patients with these uh, findings of persistent severe fatigue, arthri arthritis and arthralgia, cardiopulmonary sequelae, cognitive problems evocatively described as brain fog, psychological and psychiatric problems, residual neurological sequelae, muscle wasting and nerve damage, altered immune responses, airway problems and sleep apnea and pneumonia, the so-called COVID-19 long haul syndrome. So we're in the process of investigating this uh, as part of a study that was funded by Addenbrooke's uh, Charitable Trust and, and hopefully uh, by a study that's been funded by UKRI using both conventional MR, DTI and functional imaging, neurocognitive and mental health assessments, cardiorespiratory assessments, immune functions and autoantibody and airway assessments. We're also looking at uh, home oximetry using the Mass Massimo technology that would allow us to get at least some idea whether these patients are having some of these symptoms because of persistent hypoxia while, once they get back home. The person who's now working with us to work up a clinic is Nyali Sitfold, one of our ID consultants, and we're hopeful that we'll be able to take this forward to a, to a more definitive study. So I've talked to you about many of these things, and I come then to caveats and cautions. First, I've talked to you about specific neurological syndromes. I'm going to suggest that maybe more pervasive neurological injury, and this pervasive neurological injury may be detectable if we have good biomarkers. I'm going to ask about whether this is specific, specific for COVID-related critical illness and talk a little bit about assessing causality. So the first of these is looking at biomarkers that we've had quite extensively in looking at uh, traumatic brain injury patients. And two that we've commonly used are GFAP, which is glial uh, fibrillary acid protein, and neurofilament light. This is a marker of astrocytic injury. This is a marker of uh, axonal injury. And Hendrik Zetterberg and Marcus, uh, Magnus Gislin, sorry, Gislin have uh, published this data showing that patients with COVID-19 have increases in both of these biomarkers, suggesting that there's both neuronal injury and axonal injury. And perhaps the NFL seems to scale more with the severity of injury. What you have here are the controls or the round circles here mild and moderate patients who seem to cluster together, and the more severe patients who seem to go up and, and have much higher levels. Why would this be? We've already talked about very varying pathophysiology. We've talked about the fact that they may have hypoxia, they may have hypotension, they may have a cytokine storm, they may have autoantibody production, they may have discrete uh, neurological syndromes that are, are driving these. And this, in a large number of patients, may be accessible in ways that doing MR in thousands of patients may not be possible. So we will be working with Hendrik and his colleagues and with our colleagues in uh, CNS COVID, uh, which is the UK consortium, which is looking forward to, to assessing these biomarker levels. So that's the first thing. The second point I would like to make is that we've talked about this in the context of COVID. And here we have nine patients with septic shock and brain dysfunction, whom we published on with Dilali Annan and his colleagues in France, with a median age of 63, with an interquartile range of 61 to 79, very severe uh, organ failure, very similar to our patients with COVID. But these did not have COVID-19. And the proof of that is this is a paper that was published in 2007. So this is critical illness neurology, which was very simple, similar to COVID. And the question is, is this, is this uh, syndrome or these syndromes of findings that we're seeing all because of COVID or is some of it common to other critical illnesses? And we don't know, but evidence is accumulating. And very importantly, some of our control patients in the studies that we will have going forward will involve patients who've got critical illness not due to COVID. Even when we look at the late outcomes, we know that late cognitive dysfunction 
uh, poor functional recovery, depression, anxiety, and PTSD, all of which have been uh, characterized as markers of late uh, long haul COVID are seen in patients with mental illness. The difference there is that these syndromes are also seen in patients who've had relatively mild COVID and have not recovered from it and have persistent symptomatology. Even more interesting is this paper that's uh, just come out in Acta Neuropathologica, where they've looked at COVID-19 patients who died, septic controls and non-septic controls, and they found that this brainstem inflammation, which was reported also by the Salpetri group from Paris, is seen both in patients who have septic, non-COVID-related critical illness and have died of it, both in the pons and medulla of lung gata. But they didn't sample the olfactory bulb for obvious reasons there. And they found uh, in this cohort of patients that they didn't see uh, more inflammation of the olfactory bulb. So both in terms of neuroimaging and in neuropathology, there seems to be a big overlap. It's very likely that there will be a Venn diagram which suggests that there are some findings that are either specific to COVID or much more common in COVID, but the overlap is likely to be huge. And the final point I would make is that we have to be a bit cautious about defining causality between COVID-19 and neurological disorders. And the Coronerve Steering Committee and all of the Coronerve investigators had put this paper forward uh, in um, JNNP uh, a couple of months ago, talking about how we look at causality. And they quoted um, a paper from Austin Bradfield Hill. Uh, this is 1965, uh, the section of occupational medicine, the proceedings of the Royal Society of Medicine saying that if you want to associate environment and disease and go beyond association and suggest causation, you've got to look at the strength of association, the consistency of association, the specificity of this association, the temporal relationship, the biological gradient, did it scale with disease severity? Was this biologically plausible? Was there coherence across similar diseases? Was there experimental evidence? And could you look for analogy across different diseases? Yes, but I would make the point that the strength of association may be difficult in COVID because it's an interaction between the disease and the host and may only occur in a subset of susceptible hosts. Consistency, yes, it's been reported from many parts of the world in varying disease clusters. The specificity we've seen is quite different, but this may be because the disease is pleomorphic. The temporality is inconsistent, but because some of them are because of direct viral invasion, some of it is because of late uh, or intermediate host responses of the cytokine storm, and some of it because it's a late immune response. The biological gradient of disease severity may be true if you're looking at the cytokine storm and you're looking at hypoxia and hypotension and metabolic encephalopathy, but maybe there is a mechanistic difference in some patients. So some patients who don't have severe respiratory COVID, as we've seen in published, uh, published papers now, may still have significant neurological COVID. There are biologically plausible links. We know that there's viral entry, there's hypercoagulability and immune activation, so that works. Coherence across other beta coronaviruses with SARS and MERS effect is seen. Experimental evidence, there, is, there are data emerging from animal models. They still require to be replicated. We need to find out uh, how some of these animal models which have very mild illness are representative of human disease. And we do know that a, a variety of viral illnesses from influenza onwards do have, um, uh, disease, have neurological uh, uh, manifestations that makes this a plausible story. But when a, a large proportion of the population, and by the end of this pandemic, something like 60 to 70% of these of, of patients in the world will either have recovered from this illness or died from it, the patients who have this illness are entitled to have other illnesses as well. And we have to be careful that we don't allocate causality simply because of coexistence and association. You may have transverse myelitis from a variety of causes. We just have to be clear that we identify quite clearly those that are causally related to, to COVID because it's important in understanding mechanisms because understanding mechanisms can allow us to, to allocate treatments in a rational way. I'll finish then by again uh, acknowledging people uh, who have contributed to this and I'll leave this slide up because while everyone here has done the work I get the chance to talk about it. Thank you very much.
So thank you, David, for that very interesting talk. Don't forget to join us next week when we will welcome Professor Tamsin Ford and she will discuss her work on the impact of COVID on the mental health of children and young people. Sign up for this and the other talks in the series on the links shown here. Thanks for joining us. Follow us on Twitter at CamNeuro to keep up to date with all that's happening in Cambridge Neuroscience.